Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jessica Orkin. I'm the CEO of SY Partners. We are a consulting firm, and in some ways, the non-consulting firm, uh, founded 30 years ago to help companies design their futures around purpose. With me, I have an extraordinary group of purpose-driven leaders who will get into not just the why, but the nitty-gritty of the what, and importantly, the how. So we have Rob Falzen, Vice Chair of Prudential Financial, who also serves on the Board of Directors. He oversees finance, risk, investments, actuarial communications, <laughs> IT, and corporate social responsibility. <laughs> Shane Grant, a Group Deputy CEO and Chief Executive Officer of the Americas at Danone, a health-driven global food and beverage company, of which you've all been having yogurt, I'm sure, um, also EVP of dairy, plant-based, and global sales, um, in North America, Danone is one of the world's largest certified B Corps. And then, of course, Patrice Louvet, President and CEO of Ralph Lauren Corporation. He also serves on the Board of Directors of Ralph Lauren. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You can't read any business magazine without stumbling across purpose, why it matters, and how companies are trying to uh, embed it into their strategies. But we often don't hear the real stories of how it works behind the scenes. Um, so today, we're going to get into the role of purpose and the role of CEOs and really helping drive and operationalize it. Um, I'm going to use for purpose SYP's definition. We can actually really debate it as we get in. Um, but purpose is the essence of your organization. It is the fundamental why that you exist in the world to do. And it also encapsulates what are you in service of as a company? What are you in service of as a community? And what are you in service of as an individual, as a leader? Um, on this stage between us, we have over 350 years of our companies operating out in the world. <laughs> I will say SYP only contributes a small part of that at 30 years. Um, but we have uh, companies who have been operating in the world and wrestling with this question of purpose for a long time. Different industries, different ways. Okay. I know that it's the morning and that you probably are on your second or third cup of coffee. But we're going to teleport ourselves into a dinner party. We are at the dinner party, and all of you are at the dinner party. Um, and you've had, if wine is your thing, you've had one or two glasses of wine. You're feeling relaxed and easy. You've gotten through the awkwardness of all the handshaking and stuff. But somebody who's standing next to you turns to you and asks, what are you in service of as a person? What are you in service of? So I ask all of you, within 30 seconds, to turn to somebody, maybe who you know, maybe who you don't, but to introduce yourself with your name, not your title, what are you in service of? Go. That's a cool exercise. It's a good icebreaker. Of course, there are one or two places where there are a couple sitting next to each other. I wonder what they're going to say to each other. <laughs> Yeah. Think about if you had to have that conversation with your wife. <laughs> yes, of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and now your dinner party host <laughs> is clinking the glass. Good luck now. And asking you to sit down at the table. <laughs> dinner begins. So we're going to start our dinner by actually asking the same question of each of our CEOs without your title and without your full job description, which I already started to list. What are you in service of, Rob? Um, I think of myself as uh, I am connective tissue. Right, the muscle exists throughout the organization. The intellect exists throughout the organization. Uh, I'm that. Ro I'm the, my role is bring that all together in a way that helps us execute against our strategy, consistent with our purpose, and then translates that from what we're doing internally to messaging outside the organization. Connective tissue, love it, Jane. Uh, I'm in service of 100,000 what we call Danoners, very passionate uh, Danone people around the world. 
trying to deliver our mission every day, which is health through food to as many people as possible. And my role is to help lead the people that really lead the business to bring that to life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in service of 100,000 passionate donors trying to enact the mission every day. I am in service of creating the conditions for our teams to thrive and leverage their full potential. Mm. Maybe coming back this way, so starting with Patrice, um, when did you go through the exercise of codifying your purpose? Because you're at the helm of an iconic organization with an iconic founder, iconic brand, where often the purpose is in the water. Mm -hmm. But you went through a formal process. When was that and why? So you're right, the company was founded 56 years ago. The purpose has been implicit from day one. Uh, we went through the exercise of making it explicit when I started in this role about six years ago. And the reason we did it is we felt like we had gotten so big that picking up the purpose just through osmosis wasn't going to be practical anymore. So short answer, six years ago. Great. And because it's no longer picking up through osmosis. Shane, what about you? I think for our business, um, it's been a process of codification and recodification which I think is really important for us. The, the factual answer is 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and the origins that are really important culturally to our business of the then CEO of Danone, who essentially declared that the role of the company went well beyond the factory gates, and that the mission of our company was both a commercial mission and a societal mission. And that was really the formation, I would say, of a large part of the sort of culture of the business today. I think, really importantly, that's been reborn multiple times, actually, to, to make it very present for today. And I would point to a couple of iterations. Firstly, when we went through the process of B Corp certification, which I think for us took our purpose to a sort of governance level, I would say, and really hardwired into the company. And we did that in 2018. And then somehow in the last year has been through another recodification in something we call the Danone Impact Journey, which says there's a few very specific chapters on how we're going to bring that purpose to life. So it's, it's had a long, lot of longevity in our business, uh, but somehow been reborn and recodified over time, which I think has been really important for us. So um, similar to what Shane described, our purpose was really born with the company 100, almost 150 years ago now. Um, we, we introduced something, and people take insurance for granted today, but when the company was founded, we innovated something that was called industrial insurance. It meant life insurance for blue collar workers. Believe it or not, that did not exist at the time our company was founded. And so you know, that's, that's now in the DNA of the organization. About half a dozen of years ago or so, we, uh, we then did a modern codification of that, so re-articulated it. And, and similar to what Patrice described, we were going through a management transition. And we thought that uh, as we went through that transition, we wanted to reaffirm the foundations in purpose. So re-articulating it in modern language um, was, we thought, a, a great way to, fa the, to uh, pr place a foundation under the transition that still gave new leadership the opportunity to re-articulate vision and strategy, but reaffirmed it with the purpose. Okay, people showed up here to get into it, to hear the how and some of the friction. When does this get hard? So we go into 2020. Each of your organizations have a purpose in place. We know, all know what the last three years have held, and it was really hard. And we're at a moment now where there is a stack of uncertainties, and it is complicated to know where to steer and what decisions to make and with what fact set. So I'd love uh, an example or a story of both maybe where purpose was really helpful in guiding, but I'd also love to hear where it was really hard. Where was purpose perhaps either not enough, or where did you actually make some decisions and realize you were slightly a degree or two off from a full articulation, full living out of the purpose? Patrice? The purpose was incredibly powerful for us during COVID. So our purpose is to inspire the dream of a better life through authenticity and timeless style. Has been, as I mentioned, kind of defined when Ralph started this company with a tie, has driven the success of the company for the past 56 years with, you know, 
few, few very limited years of challenges, but mostly very successful run. And um, is still incredibly relevant today. It helped us through COVID on a few fronts. The first one is there is a stage where, if you remember, there was uncertainty into how, what the situation was like from a health safety standpoint. And no clarity from government or local authorities on what to do with our stores and our offices. And so we had to make the call, should we keep operating or should we close with the economic implications of closing? And we looked to our purpose and said, listen, we're about inspiring the dream of a better life. Health is critical ahead of anything else. And so we will forego revenue and we will close our stores well before anyone directed us to do that. The second example is, um, is in the, actually in the, in the way we engage with consumers. Most of you, I think, know that this company is first and foremost an amazing storyteller. And the purpose made us realize, particularly over the past few years, that we were telling our story through a more narrow prism than we should and weren't necessarily reflecting all the communities that we were serving. And the uh, catalyst for that was uh, the very sad murder of George Floyd. And I think all of our companies used that time to reflect on what we were doing and what we needed to do differently. And we realized that we were not telling the stories of the black and African-American community in the way we needed to. And one of our young designers, a black designer, actually took the lead and went to see Ralph and said, you know what, Ralph, we need to actually pivot our storytelling and broaden it to make sure that we are also telling the stories of all the communities that we serve. And we serve a very diverse range of communities. And this led to a program that we did with um, Morehouse and Spelman Colleges, HBCUs, which was a combination of really looking back at the history of students throughout the years in these colleges. We created a special product capsule and also an education program internally for our teams. And Jessica, that was a pivotal moment for us, I think in the history of the company. I'm sure 20 years from now, people will reflect and say, wow, that change of how you tell stories as a company, how you make sure you integrate all the communities that you serve in, in, uh, in your storytelling, uh, is actually a wonderful expression of, of the purpose and has really changed our lens on storytelling. All right, and part of our, our team is, is here who works on that. And you're going to see from Ralph Lauren now storytelling that reflects the heritage, the values of all the communities that we serve. And I think that puts us on a really exciting journey. Those would be two examples for us. Shane, do you want to take us into a, maybe where it was hard? Yeah, happy I'm to. glad I left. Thanks, uh, Patricia, yeah. for uh, <laughs> taking the first part of that. I appreciate that. Um, look, think, uh, I'm happy to give maybe a couple of um, more challenging or perhaps bigger calls for us. I think maybe firstly, before I do that, it's, it's really important for us in the way we think about our purpose that the purpose is about the business. And w w what I mean by that is the application of this, if it's real, is about the what the how, the where we sell. Because that's how consumers experience our business. You know, we're a branded business, and so, you know, we're, we're really proud of our, what we sell, which is, you know, inherently good food. You know, a leader in yogurt, a leader in premium organic milk, a leader in plant-based, and others. But it has to inform how we evolve the business. And it's not surprising that the growth engines for us are, because they follow the consumer, but consistent with our purpose, low and no sugar, gut health, plant-based, high protein. These are pushes for our business that are right for the consumer and very connected to our purpose. I think on some of the larger applications and maybe the more challenging moments, but also some of the moments that make our business and our people the most proud and most sort of the most demonstration of our purpose, you know, if you think about sort of the infant formula crisis that this country quite unbelievably went through mm. in the last 18 months, the truth is that our business footprint in North America does not really have a meaningful infant formula business, but globally we really do. And some of you may know the brand Aptamil. So we decided with some risk that we were going to step into this. 
and with partners and unbelievable retail partners bought in almost two million units of infant formula into the US with the help of the White House to help. And these are big societal moments where it's really important that we make the right decision to step in. I would give you perhaps a, a less sort of universally shared example, which is um, you know, the Dobbs decision, where if you go back to our purpose and mission, health through food, to as many people as possible, we are in the business of health. We consider that a health issue. And so facilitating the policies and practices to create the right freedoms for our people with concrete policy adjustments is something we would decide to do and talk about. And yet there's a whole lot of other subjects that we do not weigh into because it's not deeply connected to the business we're in or our purpose. Um, and we do that sometimes knowing that not, not everyone will agree, including some people in our company. But as long as we're transparent and straightforward on the rationale, then, then we move forward. Um, at SY Partners, our purpose, uh, which was actually written and codified uh, well before me taking the helm um, as CEO, which was three years ago, uh, Jan 1st of 2020, um, we chose to actually keep it in action because um, it's been very powerful for us. So what it is, uh, is um, we believe that it is worthy work to envision, fight for greatness. That is the work that we do every day. And why that's important is because greatness, as a word, can be re-interrogated and reinvestigated as times change. So it gives us a way to say, we're shooting high, we are going to push as we work with our clients to really imagine and help them imagine what is a great company, and we've done that with many people and your companies here. Um, and keep going, but then also redefine that as societal norms change, as our aspirations change, our employees push us. Um, but it's a tension because purposes shoot high. Purposes talk about an aspiration in the world you want to create. And then there's the everyday of operating. So Rob, can you take us into a little bit of that, this really lofty, important goal and then what is the work of trying to pull that into Prudential and making it alive? Yeah, so I guess we think of ourselves as a company that's purpose-driven, um, uh, vision-led, and, uh, uh, and rooted in resiliency. And so as we think about that, you know, there's a connection between all of that. So purpose is, uh, essentially informs the foundation of how we think about the vision that we articulate on the strategy that flows through to that vision. And so from our standpoint, um, it's actually, uh, again, given the, the history of the company, it's actually quite natural for us to align strategy and its daily execution, how it manifests itself and how our businesses conduct themselves in the marketplace, how our employees conduct themselves with regard to our customers in a way that's entirely consistent with that. Now, having said that, um, you know, we talked about uh, this a little bit at, a, at a breakfast this morning, um, operationalizing purposes, you know, it, there's a, there's, it's complex, particularly for large organizations. Um, and, uh, and so what you find is uh, it's, it's extraordinarily important that as you, you take a moment like we had, where you have an ability to re-articulate purpose, um, uh, and for us it was a moment in time like Patrice you described, um, which, which sort of resonated with people, um, that you do that in a pretty careful way, you know, retain a consultant. Um, the, uh, uh, but you know, we thought about that as there's a discovery process you go through, um, there's an articulation process that you have to go through. Um, and, and then there's a, you know, a socialization or communication, an activation process that you have to go through. Um, and each of those steps is critically important if you're going to ultimately have buy-in from the organization at the end of the day and truly internalize purpose in a way that it shows up in the operations of the organization. Um, and that, that first step of discovery, which you find, particularly a company as old as ours, is that um, the purpose is there. It's in the DNA. You've got to talk to people. You get a sense for culture. Mm -hmm. Um, culture is separate and, uh, fr from purpose, but they're very closely linked to each other. Purpose, some, you know, a culture sometimes uh, facilitates purpose, sometimes it gets in the way of purpose, actually. And so you have to understand that pretty deeply. We did fun things like this culture jam. I don't know if anyone's ever done something like that before. You're all day on an online thing, you know, going back and forth in conversations. It can get pretty tricky at times, but it was, uh, it was, it was helpful, it was informative. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then when we went to the articulation phase, we said, you know what, we're not gonna make this a top-down exercise. We did a simultaneous top-down, bottoms-up. 
Um, and we had, we had a statement, of, everyone understood the purpose, it was there, but the words were important. And so that when we decided, when we chose the words, it wasn't going to be something that, you know, we, we as a leadership team took a stab at it. We articulated a vision. And then we had the next level and two down take a same stab at it. And the end statement of purpose, making lives better um, through um, uh, dealing with the challenges of a, uh, financial challenges in a changing world, um, that was a statement that was more reflective of what came bottoms up than what was ultimately articulated tops down. I want to I wanna understand this, make sure I'm understanding. So you had exec team do it, an exercise, yeah. reflection, and then, and then you asked others without passing that down. Correct. So they blank slated it. Blank slated it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and what you saw was conceptually a complete intersection. There was, you know, you would say that's just a different way of saying this, the same thing. So there was complete alignment with regard to what our purpose was. But again, words matter a lot. Uh, and we found that the way they articulated it was better and, and resonated better with the organization. Can I build on, on your point that's super important on the operationalizing it? Yeah. We, we talked it, uh, in detail this morning. There's always the trap that as an organization, we, we focus on purpose, we do all the great work to define it, and then we stop there, right? And the key insight for us, and I think for many companies, is purpose by itself is not enough. It can't just be a statement in the lobby of your headquarters, right? We chatted this morning, Theranos had a purpose, had a really nice sounding purpose, actually. It has to come to life, and it has to come to life consistently in a way that's relevant over time, through, and this is the complexity of the work, right? Through all the stakeholders that we serve, our employees, our consumers, our investors, our partners, the communities we operate in. It's complex work. It's complex work that requires daily supervision, daily reinforcement, because trust, which we chatted about this morning a little bit, uh, gets created when people see the purpose come to life and gets eroded very quickly when the behaviors don't line up with the purpose. And I think often, the trap we fall into is we put a lot of energy into developing the purpose and we're like, we're done. Now people will get it and they'll behave accordingly and that's far from sufficient. Let's demystify this a little bit when we talk about operationalization. And Shane, I think you of all of us have the largest workforce uh, distributed throughout the world. How do you get, it's one thing for all of us to sit here and embody our purpose, live our purpose, make decisions from our purpose. How, how are we operationalizing? And with some examples to make this tangible for people who may be looking at this in their own organizations. It, it's really hard, I think, is the honest answer, and it's daily work. I, I think um, for us, there's probably been a few things that are really important. F firstly, and to build off Patrice's point, if you're serious about the purpose manifesting and showing up, you have to hardwire the purpose into the business and hardwire the purpose most concretely into what you sell, the business of the business. And so for us, that's about brands. And, you know, so does Horizon Organic have a relevant uh, purpose component to what the brand means? Uh, one of our brands, that one of our leaders that's in the room today is called Too Good. That's about good for you and good for others. And it's fundamentally about taking on access to good food. And it does that in a very concrete way, and it's part of the meaning of the brand, and it's how, how we build relevance with our brands. When you push that to more executional levels, when we talk about health through food to as many people as possible, what does the to as many people as possible mean? Are we providing the relevant access points? It's fantastic that we have you know, a stable of quite aspirational brands that we're really proud of, can all levels of the socioeconomic spectrum access those brands? And concretely, it comes back to where are the brands available? Are they available in Whole Foods, but are they available in a discount dollar store? Are they available in relevant small packages that people can access? And so it comes down to quite operational decisions that prove to ourselves, to our partners, to our people, that we really, really mean it. And by the way, all of those things are great for the business. They're fundamentally good for the business, especially in the context we're in today. And, and so that's what I mean, this sort of example of hardwiring the, the business into the purpose. And the more we do that, the more ability we have to scale the purpose and mission of the company. So I think for us, that's sort of the torture test. And then, of course, there's some moments you know, that are really important, be they societal moments where we step in or not, that are really important symbols 
but a lot of this is the day in, day, day out work of really operationalizing um, the purpose. You want to weigh in on that? Well, uh, yeah, I actually don't disagree with anything that was said, and I'm quite aligned on that. That ultimately, if you, when you try to activate it, um, it and operationalize it, it's actually your action. You know, the adage: your actions speak louder than your words. It's you, you have to demonstrate it. You have to demonstrate it in the businesses that you select to be in and the products that you sell within mm -hmm. those businesses and the customers that you're trying to address and how people conduct themselves. And uh, we, we also chat about this a little bit. You know, when your employees actually, you know, the nice thing about being a purpose-driven company is I think you have a competitive advantage in attracting the best talent that's out there. Now, that talent, when they join you, they have a high level of expectation. And they will hold you accountable to whether or not you're living that purpose because if they see actions that are inconsistent with that purpose, they're going to call you out on it. Um, um, and so I think that's how it actually lives and breathes and, and, and um, is, you know, the, the, the accountability around it. Now, for, for us, again, um, it's embedding it into the business so that it's not a poster that sits in the lobby, but rather it's how businesses think about the, their, their commercial success at the end of the day, not just their societal success. So one of the ways that we think about the power of purpose is that it enables and activates distributed decision making. Um, such that people have I'm it. laughing because I think exactly the same way. Right? Yeah, well, I, yeah, yeah. And I think about it also because each of you have, um, there's a pretty wide distance between the executive team um, and the people in HQ, if we still have HQs, um, from that all the way through people making mm -hmm. daily decisions mm -hmm. that touch customers. So Patrice, you have stores all over the world. How do you see the purpose driving distributed decision making, perhaps at the level of stores? So it starts, what I love about where we landed on our purpose, and actually what Ralph created is, it defines the business we're in, right? And often um, people think of Ralph Lauren as, yeah, you guys are an apparel company. We're not. We view ourselves as being in the dreams business. Mm -hmm. And I actually think there's a closer parallel with companies like Disney than there is with other apparel companies. And so our teams that are in contact with the consumer through the communication of the purpose and the discussions that we have, they, they, their task is how do you make sure you bring this dream to life in the consumer interactions? One of the specific examples how it helped us uh, pivot is we used to do that really well in our full price stores, but you really didn't feel the dream in our outlets and you didn't feel the dream on our website. On our website, you felt discount. And in our outlets, you felt discount. And we came to a realization that unless you do it holistically, it's irrelevant. Uh, and so now we're making sure that we're telling the stories and projecting people into worlds on our website, in our outlets. It's a journey. I think we made phenomenal progress on our website. We have a lot more work to do on our outlet business to ensure that every touch point supports the, the, the ultimate purpose. But I, I think. To Rob's earlier point, this is a phenomenal way to bring amazing and retain talent, right? Because people, they don't come to a company just for the day-to-day -day work. They want to be part of something bigger. I always love this, this question, which is, would you rather be a bricklayer or would you rather build a cathedral? Technically, it's actually the same job, but you think about it differently, right? Um, and certainly what we, we have seen as we put more emphasis on our purpose, make it more explicit, that it, it has an impact on our teams, it has an impact on recruiting. You mentioned earlier, Rob, you talked about success, and, and I think you, know, you have to drive accountability on is the purpose coming to life or not. So we, like everything, we can actually track whether it's coming through. We track it in our employee surveys. We track it in our brand equity surveys. We have a question around are we enabling consumers to dream, and how do we compare to other brands in the industry to make sure that on a constant basis, because we're recruiting people every day, Make sure on a constant basis that we keep that top of mind and we're reinforcing it consistently. Shane, in terms of distributed decision making and cascading, what would be a decision that we would see that is um, but pretty far out, so not within, that we would see because of your purpose? Well, I hope you'd see decisions that are daily, quarterly, annually and the next 50 years through our company. Mm -hmm. Because I think for us, that's the measure of, have we really got it all the way through our business? With the philosophy that we are always trying to drive decision-making down to the, the right point in our organization, which for us, 
the right port in our organization is generally the people that are closest to the consumer or the customer. And by the way, that's not me. For me, the, the, the leadership role in really enabling the purpose for our people and serving our people is it's really important, the process up front, and Patrice talked, I think, well about sort of the construction of that six years ago. This is a leadership accountability, and it has to be co-constructed or you've lost the team from day one. If you haven't done that initial formation right, it's really hard to hold our people accountable for the manifestation of the purpose. I think particularly in big businesses, and you know, we have 100,000 people, we have 25,000 people across the Americas, there is an ongoing leadership role to coordinate the enablement of that purpose because we're not perfect. And big businesses and big systems can stray. And so having the right leaders in the right spot under the adage that the senior leaders are only as good as the worst leader, that can really drive our purpose to good effect is really, really important. The last piece I would say is that, you know, we are leading the people that lead the business. And so the coaching role and always going back to the fundamental questions that are both strategic and purpose led and the, rep the repetition of that helps to reinforce the kind of behaviors we want. And the enablement of the purpose is really about culture. Like, do we really believe this? Are the behavior is consistent. And that's largely about coaching and coaching and coaching and having the right leadership team in place to make that happen. We, um, one of the sessions a couple days ago, we heard from the CEO of the Doris Duke Foundation, um, who might be in the room, um, and he made an observation uh, that organizations are the accumulation of daily decisions over time. Mm -hmm. And I think there's truth in that. There's absolutely truth in culture. It's the exact same thing. It is not what you say it is. It is what daily decisions, daily actions that accrete over time. And yet I do believe that purpose, vision, values are a way of steering those decisions. And without that, it really is perhaps a fairly random uh, accumulation of those decisions and your company gets uh, dispersed, slightly confused. You see some decisions coming out that are not in alignment. I know everybody here is an advocate of purpose, is running their companies with purpose. Um, I kind of wish, wish we had a fourth chair Somebody to sit up here and go, yeah, that's nice. Sounds like a lot of work. You got to bring a lot of people along. Come on, really? Can't we just get back to business? What would you say to that person? What is the argument you would make? And then I'm going to have a follow up about a time you got beat up. But <laughs> what would you say? Someone who's not a believer in purpose. And I, again, and there's a lot of business case that actually supports it. But even with that business case, there are still leaders who are just like, too much work. I know what we're going to do anyway. What would you say? Very, very simply, I would say it's about future proofing your business. Huh. So if you're not interested in the long term success of your company, then yeah, don't waste your time on purpose. Uh, if you want to future proof your business in your ability to recruit great talent, in your ability to recruit consumers, in your ability to attract investors, in your ability to have partners that want to work with you, in your ability to engage with communities that actually want you to be there and want you to be supported. It is, it is critical. So I think it's, it, there's a lot of noise around purpose and, and wokeism and, and so, so on and so forth. But if you go back to the stakeholders of companies and what we are here to do, which is create value for all the stakeholders of the company, simplistically for me, this is about future-proofing your business. So it's not a nice to do, it's not about generating nice media headlines. It's not a side activity. It is core to the long-term success of companies. And I think the fact that our three companies have been around, we're the, we're the youngest one after you for so many years is a, is a clear sign that purpose drives long-term success. Yeah, let me just jump in on that. You know, purpose drives financial success and it, and, and, it, and it drives financial resiliency. Business success, which leads to financial success and resiliency. We've been around for almost 150 years. Two world wars, numerous regional conflicts, a depression, uh, two pandemics. Um, you know, just, it is societal issues and, and, and crises that have occurred. And we've weathered it all. How did we weather it all? Because 
purpose. We were, we, were, uh, we were anchored in purpose, which helped us to navigate crisis after crisis after crisis. And it creates the resiliency, Patricia, that you were just talking to. And so that's what I would say, which is if you want to be around for 150 right. years, get on the bandwagon. If you're going to be around for 20, then, then uh, you'll have at it. I, th I think it's really important to dimensionalize the subject that it's, this is not about the issue of the day. Mm -hmm. This is about a sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing I would offer to that is um, this is inherently measurable. Inherently measurable. So if you think about for us health through food to as many people as possible, we can measure both components of that statement. What's happening with the portfolio? How accessible is that portfolio through the lens of health? And then deeply commercially to as many people as possible, is the, are we in a growth business? Is the business growing? Is it competitive? Are we reaching more consumers? All of those things are inherently uh, hardwired into the business and the performance of the business. So I think this notion of sort of the, um, these two disconnected subjects versus two deeply connected subjects of the performance and the purpose of the business is at least how we have the dialogue inside our company. Yeah, and we're working with organizations and with CEOs some of whom who come in believing that, they believe that purpose fuels performance and per performance actually creates the license to even invest more in purpose, in people. Um, so it creates this infinite loop. But some come to us not believing that. And so it is a process sometimes of connecting them with leaders like you and having those conversations, um, but building it into the work of the work of the conversations that actually lead us to a new strategy that has purpose embedded into it. A lot of us in this room um, have children. A lot of us in this room, some of us in this room, um, are Gen Z. Talk to us about the role of this next generation and their relationship to big business and their relationship to your companies, your purposes, um, at least talking about SYP, our younger generations are really pushing hard, um, holding an ever higher bar and holding us really accountable, which is good, but it's hard. What are you seeing? Well, I, I don't fit, I have children, in fact, I have grandchildren at this, but my, probably my grandchildren are gonna be Zers for God's sakes. Um, yeah, so uh, my children are the millennial generation. Uh, uh, and, and actually, what, you know, so what I see through them um, and what I see in our, our, uh, our own um, workspace is actually, so we're, we have multi-generational, we've got you know, uh, 49,000 employees around the world, um, that, that um, surprisingly, um, Jessica, I might push back a little bit on that, which is that the, the type of talent that gets attracted to a platform like ours is gonna have a lot more in common than not. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm, I am absolutely sure that on a generational basis, if you look across this, you know, the, the society, you're gonna find that there are absolutely clear differences um, in ob objectives and, uh, and preferences, um, that what we find is that there's more that binds them together than defines them as apart. Um, and so yes, as we look at you know, younger generations coming in, they have a level, a level of energy and a level of expectation. But frankly, our older employees have the same level. Um, you know, they take a certain pride in association with the company. They want to be at a cocktail party and say, who do you work for? I work for Prudential and be proud to make that statement instead yeah. of embarrassed to make that statement. I worked for many years with Joanne Jenkins at AARP, and I'm so glad you made the point about the intergenerational and that our older employees are also pushing just as hard. Oh. Okay, I want to return to our dinner party. And the table includes all of us. What are some questions? that you might have of folks who, ooh, okay. Kevin, let's run a mic to Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Kevin Kelly at Wired Magazine. A little bit of follow-up on your last comment about the generational. Um, you began this brilliantly by asking us individually for our mission statement. And the three mission statements of the CEOs was a little confusing about whether it was their personal mission statement or the corporation mission statement. How do you reconcile with the mission statement of an individual, the talent, the employees, and, and the, the corporate um, mission statement? Is it the idea that you would persuade 
the employees that their mission state would, would include the corporation's success? Or is it something that they would have two different mission statements, their own personal dream yeah, and the dream like of the company? Or how does that work out? Where is, is it that you want to actually make the employees mission statement come true? I, I'm, I'm, because they could be in conflict. And I think it may be part of the reason why maybe not everybody wants to work for a 100,000 employee corporation because it might seem that they're subsuming their own mission statement. So how do, how do you reconcile and deal with that? Let's start with Rob, and then I would love to hear that from all of us. Yeah, and I'll try to be quick so everyone gets an opportunity on it. But I, I love the question because, um, as, as, as Jessica introduced me, I have a lot of the functional parts of the organization reporting into me. And so you think about it, I have internal audit reporting into me, right? And so you're trying to, how does internal audit connect, you know, making lives better through, you know, um, through help, helping to resolve, you know, financial challenges in a changing world. Um, and, and yet, so, so they're going to have an articulation of their own purpose that fits into that. And so when they came back to me and they articulated that, said, what do we do? We actually um, inform our leadership teams in order to give them confidence in making decisions as they look to execute against our purpose. That's how they tied it in. So it's, you know, are, are they actually on the front line selling product to, you know, individuals and providing that financial security? No, but are what they're doing is empowering employees who are doing that. We like to say in our organization, I'm stealing it from another CEO, but it's like you have two types of employees. You have ones who deal with customers, and you have ones who help those who deal with customers, right? And so we try to make that connection. So they're, they, they've got to, they've got to um, uh, tailor it, but it's still, it's still entirely aligned with the broader company purpose. Let's go a click deeper. So Shane or Patrice, whoever wants to jump in, um, when it's really personal, when someone comes to a company because they want to make a change out in the world and they hold that as their purpose, how do you bring that into relationship and conversation with the purpose of the organization? I think um, maybe to start, and I'm sure Patrice will build, I think it's okay to acknowledge that there's a certain amount of self-selection that happens in the process. So for us, you know, a company held through food to as many people as possible, a big consumer packaged goods business, there's a duality in the relationship between the people we want to attract and the people that want to come to Denone. And so there is an immediately a narrowing of the funnel and some degree of alignment of interest, which I think happens at the first stage. I think the second stage is, um, depending on how you are wired, no pun intended, really, really important, which is the work of being able to ladder down from the purpose to the strategy of the company, to then the role of the team and different teams and the individual, and how that ladders through the growth strategy up into the purpose and mission of the organization. That's really detailed work. It's team by team work. But what it allows is obviously a system to work in unison at its best, and it's not always at its best, to fill, fulfill the strategy and the purpose of the company. But more specifically, I think to your question, it allows our people to achieve their goals and develop and grow and be successful as people, professionally and personally, when we get that right and have the rewards that come with that, both financial and career growth and ambition, achievement, and for their families. So I think that sort of work of, um, there's some self-selection, and then there is some wiring work that has to happen in big organizations that connect the individual work to the strategy of the company, which ultimately is a manifestation of the purpose. I think Shane, Shane, and, Shane and Rob said it very well, but I guess a few things to add in. The way you asked your question is actually quite interesting because if there's confusion between our own purpose and the company purpose, that's a good thing. It means the leaders of the organizations are aligned with their own purpose and the organization's purpose. Uh, and I think the anchor has to be the organization's purpose, and we don't aspire to recruit everybody on this planet. We aspire to recruit people who can see the role they can play in the purpose of the company. The second thing is, and you heard me talk about the fact that as a leader, what I would like to be able to achieve is to create the conditions for people to thrive and leverage the full potential, is how do we create those conditions so that everyone's individual purpose, if it's not, perfectly uh, the same definition of the company's purpose was still right for us, can be expressed, can, can be brought to life. I have a contrarian example, which is we have a few leaders, uh, 
whose sole motivation is to make a lot of money, they're not staying very long at Ralph Lauren. Because that's not, that's not what we reward, that's not what we're looking for. Of course, we'd like people to do well, but if you're at Ralph Lauren just to make a lot of money and see the stock price go up, you're probably not going to make a long-term successful impact, and you probably don't have a long, long run in, in our company. So, so there will be situations where the purposes don't align, and, and that's okay, and we, but we're not going to compromise the company purpose for that. Actually, at SYP, we have found that employees have come to SYP because they want to learn the tools of purposeful change. Some of them are actually less interested in applying that to multinational corporations. And some of them have come because they want to apply those tools to, say, climate action. And interestingly, so that would be their personal purpose, right? And they want to get equipped with how to make change there. Interestingly, they're pushing us to say, all right, SYP, how are you helping companies with climate action, because that's where we should be putting our energy. And they've pushed us into some areas we haven't been in. Okay, question from this side of the room. In the back. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jenny from Georgia. My question to everybody, everybody in the room actually, have y'all seen the movie Flaming Hot? Don't worry, I'll tell you about it. It's about <laughs> the um, story of Flaming Hot Cheetos being created by um, an idea of a janitor who got this idea to the CEO. So my question to y'all, how do you let your employees get to you with great ideas? Okay, and let's do one person because there are a lot of questions out there. Who wants it? Go can, can, can I give a perspective on it? I, I think, um, there's a bunch of mechanical things we could talk about on that subject. IT tools, Dropboxes, et cetera. I don't think that's the interesting part of that conversation. I think the more interesting part of that conversation is what's the culture in the company? And is it a culture that really values uh, two-way dialogue? Is it a culture that's comfortable with having successes and problems proudly on the table in equal weight so that we can attack the opportunities and the problems together? Is it a culture where there is access all through the company? And, and I think, and is it a culture that drives fear out of the building? Mm, nice. So that bravery enters the building and then some of those market opportunities start to appear from all parts of the organization. See where the best ideas generally come from, which is, the pieces of the organization that are closest to the consumer or the customer. So I, I do think sort of the cultural transformation of any organization and team, it has been true for us, is the unleash on innovation and consumer centricity and growth. Uh, I also, by the way, make them a whole lot more fun places to be when those sort of things can happen. Somewhere here, in the back. Get to you, Christopher. Uh, hey, I'm Bart, uh, I'm 27, and my question is related to being 27. Uh, what was your purpose uh, at the age of 27? And if you did not consider yourself a purpose-driven person at the age of 27, when did you start considering yourself as one? Well? Yeah, if I'm going to be transparent about it, uh, at 27, I'm not sure how purpose-driven I was. Uh, I had a stint in my career where I was an investment banker. You're not particularly purpose-driven when you're an investment banker, I can assure you of that. As apologies to any other of my uh, co uh, uh, um, uh, uh, bankers. Uh, you know, for me, it evolved over time um, as actually the more exposure I got to the company I was working for, Prudential, uh, that I began to connect um, moments when I was proud to be a part of the company. And, you know, like any big company and, and storied company, we had moments we're less proud of. Uh, and that's when it actually began to resonate with me is I want to work for a company that I can always be proud of and never be ashamed to be in a cocktail party talking about who I work for and what I do. Um, so that was probably much later in my 30s, I'd have to say, than in my 20s. <laughs> At 27, I'm not sure I was even married yet. I know Jesse, you just want one person, but if I could, no, no, if I could this, jump everybody. in. Uh, yeah, same. I wish I could tell you I had a purpose at age 27, but I'd be misleading you. <laughs> uh, so later on, we just went through an exercise as a leadership team. So these are 40, 50 year olds, right? Um, we asked everyone, what's your purpose? And for many people, and one, uh, one person said, well, I want to be CEO. <laughs> Not possible because the role's already taken. <laughs> uh, but we said to that person, this, that's not a purpose. That may be a career goal, but that's not a purpose because purpose, as you define it up front, is the why of how are you going to make a difference in this world? What do you, what's unique that you bring to this planet? How are you going to make an impact? 
And so often, we've, I think, particularly when we're younger, we've, we fall into the trap of we define it as a career goal, and that's, that is not ultimately what purpose is all about. Shane, send us out. This is the last one. Well, I think maybe to acknowledge uh, when I was um, in my 20s, I was mostly on a hill not far away from here, actually, um, <laughs> in a colder version of this place. But to acknowledge sort of maybe what I was doing at that point. I think for me, um, it's been an evolutionary journey. I think for me, what I've realized is a few things for me personally. One is working in a system and an organization that has purpose at the center is how I want to apply my energy. Because I could all apply my, I could apply my energy in a lot of ways, as could you, as could all of us. That's somewhere I want to apply my energy and skill. I think, secondly, more and more I am driven by a, a motivation to prove the model. Mm -hmm. Which is this model of performance and purpose hardwiring is the model. And that's ultimately about proving it by making the business crazy successful. A growth business and a winning business. Knowing that's not a straight line, by the way. I say that with one of our board members on the stage. <laughs> but the, the general direction of travel is a winning growth business and a transformationally better business. And I think the third piece, which is the most foundational for me, is the, the people piece and what gives our people energy and seeing that transformation in our people with purpose at the center is massively influential and impactful as a leader in serving people through with purpose at the center. Thank you for asking the perfect Great closing question. question. Thank you all for joining our dinner party. Give it up. Thank you. <laughs>